All right. Welcome to the Hobo Thinga podcast. My name is Crystal Cedino, and I am the Training Development Manager for the Native Learning Center. I'm thrilled that as our listeners, you're coming in weekly and listening to all of our new episodes. So thank you for tuning in for another one. Um, well, with that being said, today we're going to be talking about the HUD BASH program with Teresa Pittman, who is the HUD BASH uh, Region 1 Coordinator. So hi, Teresa. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, thank you, Crystal. I really do appreciate this opportunity um, to talk about HUD Bash and tribal HUD Bash. So I am Teresa Pittman. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I work with the um, National HUD Bash Program Office at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. As you mentioned, my title is the Region One Coordinator. So I cover um, a really big area. We have three different regional coordinators, and so um, what we do is provide. Um, support and information to VA facility and staff within certain areas. And so my area covers New England down to Northern Virginia, a little bit into, West, well, absolutely all of West Virginia. I cover Kentucky and Tennessee. And then I have a section of the Upper Plains, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, and a little bit of border states within my region, um, you know, where we kind of just go a little bit into some of those other areas. But that's the main um, places that I have. And then it's because of the Northern Plains area that I became involved um, with developing the Tribal Head Bash program. Awesome. Thank you. And then, of course, I could never forget my right hand. <laughs> Cora, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm Cora Anthony, and I'm the Training and Development Specialist here at the Native Learning Center. Yeah, so Teresa, thank you so much for taking the time to do this podcast episode because I think um, it's, you know, well known that as far as Indian country is concerned, it's so important to make sure that they get this information and it's just, you know, it's just important to share like, you know, all these resources that are out there. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy right. to do it. I'm really glad to be able to, to share about it. Yeah, awesome. All right. Um, so let's kind of just jump in, right? Um, so let's talk about what exactly the HUD Bash program is and who benefits uh, the most from it. Sure, so it's a partnership between the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, HUD VASH provides supportive housing, which is the VASH part, VA supportive housing. Um, and then that um, is part of our mission to end veteran homelessness. So those are the folks who are really benefiting our homeless veterans and then their households, whatever family might live with them, a spouse, children, you know, whomever. Um, so um, HUD Bash has a Section 8 voucher called a Housing Choice Voucher to provide rental assistance to homeless veterans. And then VA provides the case management and supportive services to veterans to help them get and stay housed. HUD Bash provides licensed clinical social workers, nurses, peer support specialists, substance use disorder specialists, employment specialists, and other professionals to um, really help um, to provide um, the assistance that veterans need for becoming and then staying stably housed, which is sort of what our goal is. We want to get those folks who are homeless housed, and we want to help them to sustain that long term. It's permanent housing, so we want them to be there permanently. We also help veterans to achieve their goals, whatever those goals may be. Um, Tribal HUD Bash is essentially the same program but we um, had veterans who were members of tribes that were in HUD Bash. They had that voucher, but they weren't able to use that on the reservation. And so um, that the facility that had this problem came to me and said, how do we do this? You know, the rental assistance is really HUD. So I reached out to HUD to find out how could we use the voucher on tribal lands. And so there was a lot of discussion, a lot of barriers were um, coming up um, around being able to do that. Some of those were jurisdictional, some of those were geographical. There was some question about whether we had the legislative authority to be able to do that. So HUD um, determined that we needed to do this in a really different way. So from that, Tribal HUD Dash was born. HUD got the legislative authority to do this demonstration program with funding to provide rental assistance through a hybrid Indian housing block grant. And so we started with 26 tribes. Um, VA provides the case management for each tribe. HUD VASH serves homeless veterans based on that federal definition of homelessness, but um, HUD VASH 
Hadash has to stick within that. Tribal Hadash serves American Indian and Alaska Native veterans who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. And that's because we know homelessness looks different in tribal communities for a lot of different reasons, right? And so that's why um, HUD really said we need to make this for those who are at risk as well. And that also is a federal definition that we follow. For tribal Hadash, we have some case managers who are members of the tribe that they serve or are members of another tribe or have parents or grandparents who were members of a tribe or came from a tribe. And then we have some who are not culturally affiliated in any way or, or you know, through, but they just have an interest in the tribe that they're serving. And so we um, really have asked for folks and have provided a lot of cultural training. Um, we utilize resources to make sure that folks are as culturally um, competent as possible. We encourage um, the case managers to incorporate um, things from um, the tribe in terms of culture, traditions, healing methods, where it's appropriate, um, and to be really um, respectful of the culture and to understand what those norms are. We know that that's going to vary from tribe to tribe, and so we encourage our case managers to get to know what the tribe's specific cultural pieces are, and then to be able to work within you know, those um, parameters in a really respectful kind of way. Um, so veterans um, must have a need for the case management in order to participate in the program. Um, and they also have to agree to participate with the case manager. So they have to engage with them. You know, we can't really bring people in who have these case management needs and have a hard time um, maintaining housing. And then we just say, here's housing, have a good time, hope you stay housed. You know, that's not going to work. So we have case managers who come along and help them to sustain in housing. So we do things like um, looking at their um, um, tenancy requirements and making sure they're able to meet those. This is the primary thing. And then we do some other things as well. Um, some veterans can graduate from the program. Um, and so once they've shown over a period of time that they've been really successful, they've sustained their you know, paying their rent on time, they're meeting their other obligations, they've, you know, shown us that they're really independently able to sustain, then they can graduate. It may be that there are some veterans who need an extended period of time or longer um, because of their health care needs or their disabling condition, and they just need more help and support. So it just depends on the individual veterans' needs as to what we're going to be able to provide for them. Um, and we really try to make that as individualized as um, is needed for each veteran and veteran family that we have. Um, so while the standard Hadash program has a team of case managers and other staff, Tribal Hadash really has only the one case manager in most cases because of that geographical distance from the VA. Some, some tribes have housed in um, urban areas, and so you're going to have, you know, the team available there. Um, Oda Odom is one of our tribes, and they um, house in the Tucson area. And so, you know, there's a VA there. That's pretty easy for us to do. Montana is with Blackfeet, and that's like three hours. So it's just really harder for us to get that whole team out there to be able to do things. However, um, those folks are still available so that, for example, if they need employment resources, there's an employment specialist who can make contact with folks in the tribe. Um, probably the case manager is able to help get those contact information and get that back to the employment specialist. And then they can make those contacts to try to establish some partnerships where we could have some employment opportunities for veterans who are in um, tribal Hadash who want to be employed and who have, you know, are not disabled to where they're not able to work. And so we try to do those kinds of things. So the partnerships are still there. The team is still there. It may just not be physically coming into the tribe. Um, we also have situations where maybe they could come out like once in a while, um, you know, if they have the capacity to do that. So if you have like some veterans who have some real health issues, you want to get the nurse to come out and do some kind of an assessment. We could probably work that piece out, but that's not going to be someone who's going to be going out in the same way they would in an urban area where they're able to easily do that. So that's kind of the long and short of Hudbash and tribal Hudbash. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs>
<laughs> and it almost answers my uh, second question pretty much. But uh, no, I just wanted to make it a point to say that um, it's such an important, you know what I mean, program. I feel like, you know, there's there's funding there. Um, and yeah, if you don't know how to access it or you don't know what's available, you're not, you know, going to go mm -hmm. after it. So, well, with that being said, um, yeah. go I ahead. Just, I just think it's so awesome and important that even though some of our tribes are in such rural areas, you guys still make it a point to assign them that one case manager just to make sure that their needs are met. So it's like, it's very accommodating um, for right. both tribes that are in urban areas, but for also for those that are in more remote locations. So right. if you guys are hearing this and you want to take part of this, let's find those case managers so you can get access well, to these resources. And let me tell you, in Alaska, where, you know, we have veterans who are in the southwestern part around Bethel and out in some of the villages, and also in southeast Alaska, we have folks who are in Juneau and also in villages. And in those situations, the case manager actually has to fly to the village in order to meet with the veterans. But they're doing that, um, you know, certainly pre-COVID, we were doing that. I don't know, with COVID, it's been a little more of a challenge because we don't want to be taking any risks with veterans' health or or the case managers. And so those things get a little bit more risky. But I know that some of the case managers are are still going out and meeting with veterans and um, just following all the protocols, you know, meeting with them outside, wearing protective um, masks and things, and making sure that they're able to still do their work in a yeah. really safe yeah. way. Definitely. Well, I mean, we've pretty much, uh, touched on this my next question was going to be what types uh what type of support you know does the program offer uh vet uh veteran tribal members i mean you kind of is there anything else you might want to add or expand on for that oh, i can tell you lots of things that our case managers do and they do tons and tons of things and so um it's really um important to sort of highlight some of those things that they do so they do everything from helping the veteran to gather the needed documents and apply for the rental assistance um, from the public housing authority um, or the tribe, the TDHE, um, tribally designated housing entity, in order to get their approval for the rental assistance. So once they come into the program, we do the initial sort of screening and get them in. And then we have to get them to the next step, which is getting the rental assistance approval. And so there are things that they have to meet. They have to be... Um, um, within their income requirements. And so that's a piece of it. We have to gather like income documents and stuff. And then we also um, have to prove who they are for the tribes, for tribal head bash. They have to determine if they're Indian based on the Hasta. And then the last thing is, is that um, nobody in the household, the veteran or any of the household members can be on a lifetime state registration requirement as a sex offender. Um, and so that's a piece that the tribes also have to determine or the PHA, whichever one. So, um, so we have to help them get to that point where they can have that done. And then once they have been approved, then, you know, if the tribe isn't housing them, then we help with finding landlords and working with, um, you know, communication between the tribe and the landlord. Um, they have to do an inspection of the home. Um, before that person's able to get that um, set up, um, they have to help um, with signing the lease, making sure that the lease is going to be appropriate. Um, you know, and the tribe will do some of that or the um, public housing authority would do that. But the case manager does a lot to sort of help negotiate some of that and do some of that in between communication. Um, so once they have the housing, then the case manager helps them with planning the move in. Um, Housing is going to be really an interesting thing if you don't have furniture and move-in supplies and food and all of those things. If you're homeless, you're not going to have that, right? So the case manager has to go and find resources, help get that, help plan that move to get those things into the home so that then the veteran and the family members have what they need in order to set up their household. So that's just sort of starting off. Once they're actually housed, then that's when the clinical work really kind of gets started. And so we use um, what we call the housing first model. We don't call it that, other people call it that. We just uh, bought into it. And so it basically believes that housing is a basic human right. 
And that once someone is housed, then the goal is to wrap those supports around the person to help them to stay housed. And so um, the case manager helps the veteran to identify what his or her personal goals are and then what strategies they want to use to try to achieve those. And then they work on helping the veteran to meet their tenancy requirements. So um, we do home visits. Um, and again, that's pre-COVID. Um, with COVID, we've been doing some virtual meetings, again, meeting outside where it's safe. Um, I think some tribes have set up places where the staff can come in and meet in a safe way. Um, and so, you know, different places have done different things. Um, and again, some places um, when everybody's vaccinated and wearing, um, you know, face coverings and all of that, they're actually doing some home visits, particularly for those veterans who are higher risk, who maybe need someone to really check in on them. Um, but they do the home visit and then the home visit really allows that case manager to check on the status of the veteran's home. So do they have enough food? Are they keeping the um, unit relatively clean and tidy? You know, one of the tenancy requirements is that they do that. They don't want um, bugs or other things coming in. Um, they also um, don't want the unit to be in disrepair so that the person needs to be taking good care of it. Um, they have to have like an egress route. You know, you, there are certain things about it that, you know, they have to be able to meet in order to meet their, their lease. So we want to check on those things. We might want to even talk with the landlord if that person is around and available, not to say, you know, anything about the veteran or that family, but to just say hello. And usually what happens is the landlord will tell you if there are any concerns or problems, and then you can go back and, and have that discussion with the, the tenant. So um, we do that. Um, the other thing that you have to do for tenancy is to allow your neighbors peaceful enjoyment of their housing. And so if there are any complaints or any issues like that, we want to be on that as well and making sure that we're talking with the tenants about how they can be compliant with that requirement. Um, so case managers are advocates for the veteran. So it's really important to help veterans to effectively advocate for themselves. So back to the, um, you know, that home inspection, if you find out that, say, there's a problem, say, you have a blind veteran and there's a problem, there's carpet and there's a place where that veteran could trip, um, say the carpets come loose or something. And so they, that's a problem. You know, want to make sure that that gets addressed with the landlord. It's better if the veteran is able to go in and, and do that. It's good practice for them, helping them to develop those independent skills if they don't already have that. But if they don't, then the case manager really needs to help advocate and support that that gets fixed so that the veteran doesn't get hurt. So those are the kinds of things that um, the case manager would do around um, working with the landlord and also helping the veteran to understand that if the landlord then doesn't do it, that there are other things that can be done. Like you can go back to your housing authority and they can come in and they can intervene as well. So um, they have some other authority that helps. So we want to help them understand and problem solve some of those kinds of things. If the veteran needs assistance with income, I've already talked a little bit about employment but we can also help them apply for benefits if they have a disability and they don't have any um, things coming in. There's veterans benefits and um, disability um, kinds of um, um, benefits. They can get service connected if they were injured when they were in the service and that's continuing to be a problem. Um, if they were in during um, the, a period of war, even if they weren't in the combat area, as long as they were in service during that time, then they might be eligible for a non-service connected pension. So we can work on that. We also can help them to work on um, Social Security Administration benefits if that's something that would be appropriate. If there are other things in the community, you know, they need um, food assistance or those kinds of things, we can work on SNAPs and those things. So um, those are um, pieces that we do. A lot of people um, don't have money management knowledge, so we can provide budgeting information, helping them to build a nest egg for emergencies or larger um, goals. We do have some. Um, veterans who have left our program because they've gone on to home ownership following our program. They no longer need us and they've saved enough money and have worked and done all of that, that they're able to then make that next step, which is fabulous. We're really happy to know that we've helped them to do that. So lots of things that we do. We also, <laughs> lots, of, lots of things that we do here. Um, we help veterans to connect with their needed healthcare resources. So a lot of times we find homeless veterans have not had a physical in a really long time. They don't know exactly what's going on with them physically. 
So we want to make sure that they get that, whether that's from a VA source, whether that's from Indian Health, whether it's from a tribal health organization, whatever that is, and wherever they want to get their care, we want to help them connect there and get set up. If they have any follow up with a specialty care or um, if, if there's information about COVID, um, we've been certainly making sure that veterans are aware of that, letting them know where they can get vaccinations, letting them know what the fact-based information on that is. We've provided masks to veterans. We've done all of those kinds of things. And then we've also helped them with achieving their health care goals. So if they have things like they need to lose weight or they need to exercise or they need to do something different, you know, we try to help them establish a plan for that. Um, we have a lot of things that are available virtually. And so, um, you know, they can get care virtually. There is a whole health program and they have some things like meditation or yoga. And so we can help them access that. We have a lot of veterans who've really enjoyed um, participating in those things. We have mental health and substance use programs so that if they have those issues, um, they're able to get access to that. Although we are licensed clinical um, providers. And so we can provide some counseling. We can't do things like medication or those kinds of things because that's outside of um, the clinician's um, area of expertise, but they can do the counseling pieces. Um, we can um, you know, get folks if they need additional care into some of those resources as well. We have lots of you know, inpatient um, and um, outpatient treatment um, for mental health and for um, substance use disorders. So we have some ways to help if they, you know, the counseling's just not working, we can do some other things as well. Um, you know, we also assess for things like suicide risk. That's a huge one. Um, I know in Indian country, that's huge. And so we assess for that. And then we have resources, lots of resources that we can provide, um, resources that allows the veterans that when we're not there, they can reach out and get some assistance if they were to need that. Um, we just think it's really important to instill hope and to provide veterans with the knowledge that, you know, that help is there and is available and that we're there to help them to achieve, you know, whatever it is that they need so that they're not in that situation any longer. We help with things like developing structure and meaningful activities. So social connections are really important. We know that community is a huge cultural value for American Indian Alaska Native peoples. And so um, case managers encourage and coach veterans with reestablishing um, or developing relationships with family, with friends, with the community, establishing some kind of routine with meaningful activities. Um, I worked with a veteran when I was in Alaska um, who joined the tribe's um, singing and drumming group, which was really important for him. He had lost connections with his culture. And so when he did that, it just helped him. It gave him a sober activity. He was really proud to be a part of that group. Um, it gave him structure because they have practices and they have performances. And so he had things he had to do it's very meaningful for him. So we want to make sure that we're helping veterans to identify if there are any of those kinds of things that would be important for them to help them to do that. Um, case managers help veterans and their households to connect to other community resources like job training, employment resources, food banks. Um, again, um, you know, that employment piece is really huge. That's um, something that I hear a lot is that um, there's a lot of um, hopelessness because you can't get a job. So helping folks to become employed just helps so much with, again, that hope, self-esteem. You know, there there's just so many pieces around identity that goes into being employed that I think is just really, is, you can't overstate the importance of that. Um, so we basically work with a veteran to identify kind of what they want to do and how they want to do it. And then we're there to help support them through that. Um, they're committed to really ensuring that their veterans um, are insured, oh, sorry, that they have the information and resources and advocacy to meet their needs um, while they're working to help them achieve that independence and self-sufficiency. Um, so a lot of things that we do. Yeah, no. <laughs> this is like a really holistic program. It, so it, it tries it to be very just, holistic. Yeah, it's yes. just like here's a rental, <laughs> go live your best life, but it's we're gonna take care of you, we're gonna help you become self-sufficient, right. and and that sounds that's just amazing because it's so needed in our communities and and whatnot that it's not just like fixing a symptom, but really kind of 
focusing on the whole situation to get them to where they need to be. So thank you for working on this type of program. Yeah, <laughs> I was just going to add that um, I think a lot like and I've said this before in other episodes and stuff like that, um, but that I don't want to call it hand holding, but you know, that support and that hand holding, I think is so important just because yeah. I think a lot of the time, even just me being a regular person trying to access, you know, uh, services through the state or whatnot, it's very confusing and it's very convoluted yeah. and it's very like overwhelming and you're not sure where to go, who to talk to, you're on the phone for hours. And, you know, so it's so nice that, you know, you have case managers that are there to be able to um, help you through the process and filling out the paperwork and whatnot, because I think that's just so important. So that's amazing. And with that being said, uh, Cora's next question. It's a good segue. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it's same thing, because this is such an amazing program, What what would be the process for our tribal veterans to apply for the program and how can they find out what office is assigned to them and get in touch with the case manager? Sure, so uh, absolutely that's what they need to do is they need to get in touch with the case manager or the program. Um, so every VA has a homeless program. Um, we don't have but 26 tribes who are participating in tribal head bash. We did just add two more, but they haven't really gotten up and running yet. Um, so, but the other HUD bash program, the standard HUD bash program, can serve any veteran. They just may not be able to live on the reservation, but they could live like border right up to it. Um, and many tribes um, don't have housing, and so they're housing their veterans off the reservation anyway. Um, and so, you know, if if someone is interested in um, HUD bash, um, they should absolutely reach out to your local medical center. So, um, there's a number that you can call. It's eight seven seven. 424-3838. That's actually our um, national call center for homeless veterans. Um, they will con connect with the medical center and have the medical center reach back out to you. So that's one way you can get in. You can go to va.gov and um, there's a place on there where you can um, click over. There's like three things and it has um, on the right, um, right under the heading is um, find your VA or VA locations or something like that. And so you can click on that and it'll help you find what's going to be your closest VA medical center. Um, and it usually gives you by distance and those kinds of things. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can um, go to, again, va.gov. And there's a place if you scroll on down that says housing assistance. The housing assistance is really a Veterans Benefits Administration home loan information page. But there's a link on there, again, for the National Call Center. And then there's a question, how do I get help if I'm homeless or at risk of being coming homeless? And if you answer that question or go into that, click on it, it gives you more information about how to get connected with the homeless program. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, we want to make that as easy as possible. And so um, lots of ways to, to connect. Thank you for that. And then I was going to ask you, are there any current updates to the program or changes? But I really want to know, you mentioned there's now 28 tribes that, that are part of this. If there's a tribe that wants to be part of this program, what do they have to do to, to get started? Sure. So um, every year, the standard hud -Bash program does have additional appropriations of vouchers. So again, off the reservation, we can assist and we have lots and lots of those standard vouchers. Um, then HUD put out a notice of funding availability in January for the tribal head bash expansion. Um, so they were able to award additional grant funding to three of our existing tribes so that they're now able to support more veterans than they were before. And we have those two new additional tribes. So the only way I'm aware of at this point is to watch for HUD to put out one of those NOFAs or NOFOs, I think they're calling them now. Um, in order to um, get that funding for the rental assistance. And once we have the rental assistance piece, VA has been committed to making sure that we have the case management to support that. Um, the NOFA has all of the information about what the tribe needs to do. What we're recommending is that they work with their VA medical center to make sure that the VA is going to support that, um, that they feel like they have the capacity to do that. Um, 
the last NOFA um, had a letter of support that had to come from the VA that basically said that. But we want to also make sure that tribes understand what the program is and that they're really um, they're they're going into it with their eyes open as to what you know what's going to have to happen with that. So things like again housing first. Some tribes have some difficulties with that because they have a um, zero tolerance for substance use, for example. Um, our program doesn't do that. We say, you know, we're helping people to learn how to, you know, meet their tenancy requirements without necessarily requiring them to be sober. We're helping them to look at some strategies to help them be able to sustain in housing. So there's some pieces that may be a little different from how the tribe is set up. And so we just want to make sure people understand that before they sign on to this program. No, it's lovely. No, it's definitely. I think that you think that's going to be common with any program, right? There's going to be like some things that are slightly different, but that's great to know in any case. Yeah. Um, with that being said, uh, are there any other resources you'd like to share with our listeners today? There is. So um, actually, if you go to HUD's website at HUD.gov, you can do a search for Tribal HUD VASH, and that gives you the link for the Tribal HUD VASH webpage that they have. There's tons of information there on the program, things like the operating requirements, um, you, you know, the information on the, um, the NOFA that went out so that people can kind of see what was in that. So again, if you're thinking about um, the next time they have one, that that might be something you're interested in that gives you an opportunity to kind of see what HUD was asking for in that and kind of where they're going um, with the program. There's training, there's all kinds of information that's on that web page that would be really um, informative for folks. Awesome, thank you so much. And do you mind shouting out that phone number just one more time that you mentioned earlier? Phone number, absolutely. It's 877-424-3838. Awesome, thank you so much. I think it's just important. I'm like, I want everyone to be able to access this. So, and like yes. you said, as easy as possible, you know, or, or as easily as possible. So, and this is one of those ways, I hope. <laughs> All right. So, well, Cora, do you have any other questions for Teresa? No, I think I'm good. Teresa, you have anything else you want to share? Yeah. Plug. I just really appreciate, <laughs> uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about Hadash and tribal Hadash. Oh, you're welcome. We appreciate you taking the time to do this. We want to get as many resources and programs and, and knowledge out into Indian country. And so we thank you for your time and we thank you for the work that you're doing for our tribal communities, for sure. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you again, Teresa, for joining us today. And as always, thank you to our listeners for listening into the Hobo Thinga podcast. Remember, if you enjoy our show, please rate us and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, and also visit our website, www.nativelearningcenter.com to find more information on upcoming webinars and virtual trainings, and be sure to come back for more awesome content. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Guys, thank you. <laughs>